Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am Krista Burns, your host here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover various Commission activities and any library topics of interest to Nebraska librarians. We have uh, Commission staff and guests sometimes speak. Uh, we do these sessions every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. They're about an hour long and they are recorded so if you are not available to watch able to watch one of our live sessions you can view the recording uh, this morning we have john felton from here at the library commission who's going to talk about presenting data to for libraries so i'm going to hand over the mouse and control of the interface to john there you go okay good morning um I spend a lot of time collecting and analyzing data, uh, but today I'm going to talk about the next step. Uh, how do you present that data to your target audience? Uh, I'm not going to do a step-by-step how-to using Excel to make charts. I think you can figure that out or there are a lot of tutorials on the web that will show you how to do that. Uh, in fact, while I will show you how charts can be a good method of presenting data, I plan to go a little further than that. Uh, go beyond those techniques and demonstrate some other means of making data that you know kind of come alive for your audience. Here's our agenda for the day, uh, for the, for the hour at least, <laughs> I should say. Uh, we're going to talk about what you should do to prepare for your presentation. Figure out for yourself. Ask yourself what is your message. And then ask who is your audience. I've put together some rules of data presentations that I think would be good to follow. And then I'll go into how you make your data speak by using the right method of presentation. And sometimes that's a table, as I've mentioned at the top there. I'm going to show you a few tools for how you can get some assistance in selecting which chart is best if you decide to go that way. I'll talk about some charting basics and then just show you some examples of some charts and graphs you can use. Then, as I promised, beyond that, we're going to talk about dashboards and data summaries. We're going to talk about map mashups, because I just love them. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about how you can do a narrative, but really emphasize the numbers in those narratives to make them stand out. And then uh, talk about how you might want to put together a pocket guide as a, as a handy handout. And in the end, I'm just going to go give you a few caveats about uh, how to use Excel charts with care. So, so let's get ready. But first, help yourself with some coffee and donuts if you haven't already. I know there's a little <laughs> lull there. Maybe you've already got your coffee. I've already had mine. So uh, I just figured, you know, if we were here together, this is what I'd be doing, is showing you, giving you some coffee and donuts to settle down. So, <laughs> so get comfortable and we'll get going. First of all, as I said, ask, you have, really have to ask yourself, what is my message before you start fooling around with charts and graphs or whatever you're going to use to present the data? Um, you need to really become familiar with your subject and decide, you know, what am I going to talk to these people about? What is it about the data that's important? So once you know what story to tell, then you can shape your presentation around it to help your audience make sense of the data that you're going to be showing. For instance, uh, your message might be to show that more residents per capita in your community make regular use of the library than in similar communities. That's your message. Now you can plan how best to convey it. The quote here is from Stephen Few, who's uh, a data presentation expert and one of my gurus, uh, who really says it very well. There's information in all this data we have, but it's up to you to get that data out of there and show it to your audience. Next, you need to know your audience. Who are they? You have to understand who you're presenting this data to, because it really makes a difference in how you shape your story. Um, are they going to be familiar with really complex data visualization techniques, for instance? Or would it be best to just stick with something familiar, like a line chart, a bar graph. Uh, what will hold their interest and help them focus on your data? Uh, who are they? Uh, 
Are you talking to your library board? Is it the city council or village board you're talking to? Is it county commissioners or is it a group of your customers? Uh, are they stakeholders in, in your library's services? This is something you need to know so you can really present the right story to them. Next, here are a few rules of data presentations. Uh, and actually, these are rules that apply to just about any presentation you're going to be making. Be clear. Keep it simple. Keep it brief. Uh, for goodness sake, make sure it's accurate and frame it with some context and meaning. Uh, these last two are particularly significant when you're presenting data to people. You don't want it to be inaccurate. And we'll talk a little bit more about how important context is when you're showing statistics. So, clarity. Uh, the quote on this slide is from another expert, Edward Tufte, who is probably everyone's guru in the data presentation field. Well, what he's saying here is make sure that your core message is the focus of what you're showing your audience. Be direct and clear about it. Don't lose the numbers in an overly complicated graphic like a chart or, or a graph. Just be very clear. I love Da Vinci's quote here, and that, again this applies to, to, to a lot of uh, presentations. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, uh, like this clock. Uh, it couldn't be much simpler than that. So I'm sure you've seen some really fancy, colorful charts that use these great backgrounds, uh, like the sun or something, uh, in publications, on websites, or even on television. But next time you see one of those, take a close look at it and decide how easy it is to figure out the message from that chart and identify which parts of that are really just distractions. Because, you know, sometimes being cool doesn't really translate into being effective. Hard to say. Mm -hmm. I love this one. <laughs> what do I need to say about this? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want your audience to pay attention and remember what you're presenting, just give them what is needed and really no more. Um, one of my former English professors from college gave me the best advice I've ever received about writing clearly. She simply said, pack meaning into your verbs. And when she said that, it didn't you know, really strike me as that uh, significant at the time, but it has stayed with me for longer than I'm going to mention. Uh, <laughs> Because it expresses the point in two ways. First of all, that's all she said to me when I showed her my paper. In fact, meaning into your verbs. Uh, but, the the, but the meaning of what she said has stayed with me for a long time. And if any of you out there don't know who this quote is from, you haven't been reading your Shakespeare. Because this is from Hamlet, uh, spoken by Lord Polonius. Brevity is the soul of wit. Oh, no, okay, here. I'm going to shift gears. Now, don't do this. <laughs> this is the one where I uh, don't follow this example. Um, uh, the media has really um, tried to redefine uh, the term accuracy and reliability, I think, sometimes, uh, by going a little too wild. Um, this graphic's been all over the Internet since it was actually used in a live broadcast. And uh, he here's a tip about what's wrong with this. Pie charts can only add up to 100%, not 193. <laughs> so uh, the point I'm trying to make here is uh, before you present your data, first of all, check your spreadsheet or your database. Make sure that the data is correct, that it's accurate, that you've double-checked it. And then after you produce a graph from it, go back and check that too. Don't just rely on uh, the program that you're using to produce the graph to figure out all the numbers for you. Make sure that it makes sense. Otherwise, you know, as soon as they see something like this, you're going to lose all your credibility. Now, you've probably heard someone say that content is king on the Internet. Well, for presentation of data, I would offer that context is king. 
because really statistics have no meaning without context. Now you can say, oh, our circulation last year was 60,000, but so what? Uh, what does that mean? Unless you provide a context like uh, what was the total last year or what kind of circulation do libraries of similar size have for that same year. See, without that, it doesn't really mean anything. So for context and meaning on this slide, for instance, we have a graphic that everyone in Nebraska has seen. Uh, I don't have to tell you that this is Memorial Stadium on game day with over 80,000 big red fans. But if you want to relate it to your audience uh, and give them some context, it's, it's a great, great graphic because you could say, oh, gosh, we had eight, eight, over 8 million people visit libraries last year. And your audience might be saying, yes, yeah, so what? But if you think about it, if your audience thinks about how that would fill Memorial Stadium 106 times, that's context. That gives them some meaning. And finally, you know what? It all boils down to communication because that's what you're doing here. You're trying to communicate and translate your data into something familiar for your audience. Now, the, the zebra on the right, uh, you know, he might be telling his friend there something really important like, hey, you know, there's a pride alliance behind you sneaking up on us. <laughs> so you want the message to get delivered clearly, and you want the audience to really understand it quickly. <laughs> this is the crux of what I'm talking about today. Uh, what's the correct method of presenting your data? And what is the method? Well, it kind of depends, like everything else. Because sometimes all you really need is the data itself. Now, this is an example I got from uh, a mutual fund brochure. And when I first saw this, I said, well, gosh, look at the, how they've done this. Uh, I've got all the information I need right here because they emphasized what they wanted you to see in, these, in this rather small group of numbers. Now, on the next page of this brochure, they had a bunch of fancy graphs, but I just paged through it because I'd already found out what I needed to know just from this quite easily. So, you, you know, if you have a small amount of data like this, and you can easily highlight it like this, go ahead and use it. It's okay to not be fancy with a graph. In fact, tables are best when what you really need to do is look up or compare individual values and when you need those values to be very precise. So here's a good table. Now, um, I told you I was going to show you some, uh, some ways to pick the right chart. So once you decide that, well, I don't want to use a table on this one, I don't think they'll get the idea. How do you pick the right one? Well, there are some tools on the web. And Chris is going to help me get to that. Uh, oh, you want to get to the <laughs> Oh, I get to the yeah. account. Do you have one of the hot ones? Actually, you might be able to. Can we do it from there? Actually, because that was a hot link right in the PowerPoint, it yeah. will jump right to it in a new, new tab. Hey, it wasn't I smart to do there that? <laughs> <laughs> OK, here's the chart user. Uh, chooser. I say chooser because it's from Juice Analytics. <laughs> it's one of my favorite sites. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of fun to use, too. And it takes it from the point of what kind of message are you trying to convey. Are you going to compare some data, for instance? You, know, you would pick comparison. And it says, okay, here's some ways you can do that. You can use a line chart like this. Same thing works with a bar chart. Or, you know, you can just use a table. Here's a table that's pretty clear. So it gives you some choices there. Uh, if you wanted to show a uh, trend over time, click this one. This gives you some ideas. They don't have all the ones I might pick here. But uh, here's another line chart with multiple data sets shown. Or, you know, it also works with stacked column chart and various things. 
So it's kind of fun. Uh, again, relationship uh, works with these different charts. Uh, if you want to show parts of a whole, you might pick this. And you can see that that's really what we're doing here. And th that's probably the only thing pie charts are good for. I'll, I'll be talking about pie charts later. In, oh, well, in unkind terms. <laughs> so I'm going to get back. Let's um, click that. Nope. Yes. Try that. that. Yep. Yes. Okay. okay. So that's, that's Juice Analytics giving you their chart chooser. You might want to give that a try. Here's another one I found, and uh, I kind of like this because it's really simple. You can print it out and stick it on your bulletin board next to your computer when you're doing this kind of work because it gives you some, uh, again, the same idea. Uh, do you want to show relationships? Try a bubble chart or a scatter chart. Uh, do you want to show comparison? Look at all the choices you might have depending on what kind of comparison you're showing. Uh, comparisons over time or trends. Line charts, column charts, multiple line charts, many categories. This is really kind of a fun and uh, very useful, actually, uh, tool for deciding how to present that, that particular message. Uh, here's another one. I'm not going to go and show you this one because it's, it's kind of lame, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you get down to actually uh, using it live. But I thought it was just so clever. I mean, here's somebody who decided, let's take the the periodic table of elements and make it into uh, data visualizations. So they go way beyond data. Only the yellow here is really the ways you would present data. And all it really shows you is, is uh, examples of those particular things. Like they show you an area chart, but they don't tell you when to use it. So it's not as useful as, as the ones I showed you. And, you know, to bring it all back home, here, here's a real simple one I put together that uh, will serve you just as well as those, as those things. Um, you just take a look at uh, what kind of charts you have at your disposal. And this is, this is certainly not all of them, but these are the ones you're probably going to use most often because when we talk about context and familiarity, these are the things that people see all the time and recognize. So there's a comfort level. So line charts, uh, they find and compare trends very well, and they're particularly good at showing change in direction, uh, which becomes like a data series over time. You can compare more than one data series over time with different line charts, and they're very simple and easy to see, show correlation. Uh, they're just great at showing how values of a data set will change over time. In fact, um, you should only use line charts uh, when the x-axis, and we'll talk about that, is continuous. Like if you're measuring uh, events over time or distance, uh, changes in temperature and things like that. Area charts, well, I'll show you one of those. They're really just um, a different way of using line charts. But instead of showing direction, they really show magnitude better. Column graphs uh, or vertical bar charts, as they're also known, um, pretty good at showing frequency, frequency distribution, if that's what you're trying to present. Um, but I would avoid stacked bar charts. I find them, and many people find them, very hard to decipher. Let's just avoid those. There are other ways to show the data. Uh, for instance, if you're going to do a, a bar chart and you've got more than one data set in, in, a, in a grouping, it's better to have them side by side than stacked, in my opinion. Bar charts are good, uh, really good for ranking data sets. I'll show you an example of that. And they can also show comparison. Pie charts deserves a whole uh, session in itself. <laughs> well, it's just, I'll show you some of the things that, that uh, in more detail that I don't particularly like what Pie charts. You can still use them, but you have to be careful um, how you use them, I guess. And since we're going to start talking about charts, here's a little primer. <laughs> and I did this almost more for me than other people because I always forget 
you know, when I'm trying to build a chart, it says, well, what values do you want in your x-axis? And I go, okay, now, which one is that? Uh, so this is a way to kind of help you. Uh, usually, the x-axis will be the one that holds your categorical information. This is the one where you provide your context. That, and of course, the title of your, of your graph. And you notice how, how spare this graph is. I don't have a lot of stuff here, and, but this really makes it less distracting for your, your viewer. And of course, the y-axis, which is normally vertical, and this, is, this will change sometimes with, with some charts, but the, the y-axis is where your data shows up. This is your, this is your quantitative information in your graph. See, these are just real basic things you can use before you start out. Uh, especially if you're like me and you just can't remember this thing. Here's a little levity. Uh, if you think uh, you think data data geeks don't have a sense of humor? Uh, sure we do. Uh, here's something I stumbled on that uh, just shows you no matter what you do with a chart, someone's going to complain about it. So this is kind of a silly thing about your chance of people complaining about it. Uh, and the reason for complaining, and you see the high one here is typos, which yeah. is itself a typo, or too simple, too complex, your spacing's wrong. I don't know what they mean by Murphy's Law, I guess because everything goes wrong. <laughs> so anyway, it's just kind of a funny way to keep this in mind that, you know, no one's ever going to be completely satisfied with your graphs, but if you make them simple and you make them clear, you'll be better off. Now I'm finally showing an actual chart. Um, this is a very simple line chart, and you'll see that my title says that it's a time series, and that with the line chart, what we're really stressing is the direction or the trend. Line charts are really quite common, uh, I suppose because they're really easy to produce. Uh, they just use a line to connect these plot lines because there's, you know, there's a, there's a point right here, there's a point right here. It's just showing, uh, you know, where your data points are on your, on your graph. Uh, but they're really good at showing fluctuations in value over time, obviously. Uh, as you can see here, the emphasis is not so much on these numbers as it is uh, the direction of those numbers, where they've gone over time. They're very good for that. And remember, these are the, the, as I said earlier, these are the only charts that display data contiguously. And you can only use a line chart when the variable on the x-axis, and remember it's this one, uh, has to be continuous, like time, like distance, or temperature. They have to be contiguous and continuous, or don't use a line chart. However, here we go. This is the same data um, as in the previous line chart, but now we're showing how it might be used in a vertical bar chart or column chart. You've got the same information, <clears throat> but this one does stress the numbers a little more carefully, and it's really better at showing uh, size or magnitude. Because what you, you don't notice as you look at this, you don't notice so much the trend as you do the magnitude of each year's figures. So, you know, you can use these two graphs for basically the same purpose, but it depends on what you're trying to emphasize, and that depends on what your message is. Are you trying to show a trend, or are you trying to show how many uses of those computers you had? Here's another line chart, and as I mentioned in that uh, 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 sort of uh, table was that uh, line charts can also be used uh, as a comparison tool. You want to compare two data sets over time. They can correlate them and they can also compare them. So again, you know, again, it stresses direction, a trend, but you can easily see from this that children's circulation over these six years has been leveling off whereas the adult circulation continues to climb. 
just I like this because it's very simple you can see it at a glance you could also uh, sometimes I don't like legends like this, this is your legend sometimes uh, unless it gets too crowded I like to take the legend and actually put it on the data set so that it's really you don't have to decode anything it's very quiet and easy so that's the way you might want to customize a graph like this but still because you have so few items it still works pretty well now area charts area charts are really just uh, line charts with the um, data filled in but they are good at showing again more magnitude than direction you can see here and they really I think they really add interest because you've really got more to look at here and you can see here what your eyes drawn to is the is the size uh, of this data you know how, how much it fills that graph so it's just another use for the same kind of uh, change in data over time now I'm not really very expert on histographs histograms excuse me uh, which show frequency distribution because it's not something I do a lot of my work but um, it's another thing that bar charts can be very good at. For instance, in this one, they wanted to see the distribution of scores among students. So they took ranges of scores on a test. That's your x-axis. That's your context. And then they showed how many students fall into those ranges here. So that's, that's what we know, what is known as frequency distribution. Then what a lot of people call histograms. And you'll see more of these in uh, scientific graphs than in statistical graphs. Now, bar charts. Boy, bar charts are really great at showing ranking. Um, in this case, it's uh, men's world tennis rankings, but not not the latest, because I'm sure things have changed since then. Catherine Brockmeyer would tell me, wait a minute, that's not right. <laughs> that's not right now. Although Roger Federer might still be on top. But I like this graph because um, they kept the, the uh, bars the same color, except the one they really wanted to emphasize. Mm -hmm. And they sorted them by size. So, of course, which of course you want to do in a ranking. And now, if you were if you were showing um, golf scores, for instance, you'd just you'd flip this, wouldn't you? You'd you'd want to emphasize the low scores, and so you'd flip around the top. Or the way I might use this one, uh, a bar graph, is if I were showing the results of a survey. So here I would have the possible questions that people could answer, and here I'd have the number of people that answered. In, in these particular ways. So that's another way that it's used. Ah, now we finally get to our pie charts. Uh, pie charts are just wildly popular. I'm sure you've seen them all over USA Today, television, magazines. Um, they're often misused and misunderstood, however, um, because they're really only appropriate for showing the parts of a whole. Okay, So you've got your whole, in this case, would be the total number of libraries in the state. And you're just showing how they're divided up by population. So you have a slice for each one of these population ranges. Um, you know, when I first started doing charts and graphs with my data, I thought pie charts were really cool, and they were fun to make, you know. But the more I played around with them, the less enamored I came, because I, depending on the, the data you're presenting, you might find a lot of problems with them. And, and the, the basic problem is that you want your data to speak, but Sometimes, even though a pie chart looks really good, it mumbles when it tries to talk. So, 
First of all, they're only good for a small set of values. Um, you notice here, if you go much more than six, five or six uh, slices or data sets, it can easily get too crowded, so it's harder to distinguish uh, the differences. Um, especially, that's especially true if you have a lot of them that are similar in size like we have here. Now, if these numbers weren't here, you'd have a tough time figuring out which one of these was the greater. Mm -hmm. The other thing about this particular one is, again, I moved that, I moved that legend. <laughs> Because it's very hard to go boom, 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 boom. If your eyes just keeps going from the data to the chart, I'd go ahead and put this as a legend in here, for instance. Um, but the big, the big problem with pie charts is that is with our eyes. The human eye just doesn't discern angles and estimate them as easily as it does distances like line lengths, and that's where we have a big problem. So. To demonstrate that, this is the same data in a bar chart. Now you can see here that, when you, especially when you get to these values that are very close, not too hard to figure out which one's the larger because of the way they're, they're organized. It's easier for you to distinguish these line lengths than from angles and slices. And, and again, another problem with that uh, pie chart is if these get if these get really small, like you've got really small values, you're going to have to do weird stuff like taking your legend and pointing to it. And I've got some like that. I admit I have done some like that where the value was so small, I, I couldn't actually put the legend inside it. I had to actually make a little arrow and point to it. It's really hard to see. So I don't like it. <laughs> there are alternatives, however. Now this is what I said, that started showing up uh, oh, in publications and on the web. It's called a waffle chart, or some people call it a, a square pie chart. And really, it's just uh, using uh, squares to represent the data. You know, you add up the number of squares to figure out what the total uh, number is. But the thing I like about this is I think it's a lot easier to see the differences in values that might be fairly close like these two. I mean, just, hey, just count the squares, man, you know? And they can, what it's really good at then is if you have very small values, like, alas, the, the amount of our savings in this country, you can see there's only one square, and it really sticks out mm -hmm. as very small. In a pie chart, that'd be lost. That'd be absolutely the teeniest, tiniest little slice, and you'd never notice it. So, what I haven't figured out yet um, it's how to make these. <laughs> um, not something you can do with Excel, and so I'm trying to figure out, although some people have tried to figure out formulas, but when I looked at them, they didn't really work very well. But, um, so I'm trying to figure out an easy way to make these, and if I do, I'll post it. So. Oh, now here. <laughs> I'm just stuck on pie charts, aren't I? I just can't get enough of them. This is just incredible. Um, this is, yeah, I think this might be the world's worst pie chart. Someone wanted to show the 100 most active uh, tweeters, uh, people using Twitter. And so they made this uh, abomination of a graph here. And, you know, look at the look at the index here. It actually goes down oh, further. Yeah. If this were live, <laughs> you've got 100 different ones. Well, this doesn't really mean anything, does it? I mean, how are you going to find... Tim Howard over here and all this business. It's just, I just did, to show you how awful pie charts can become. Because this one doesn't really mean anything. I love it. It's just great, great crap. <laughs> oh, and this one's, oh my god, oh dear. Okay, this, this is actually the pie chart's uh, f food metaphor cousin, the donut chart. It's really kind of the same. Same idea, trying to show parts of a whole. But this one uh, succeeds in, in violating the rules of clarity, simplicity, and brevity all at once. It's just <laughs> amazing. Um, you know, it really isn't necessary that people see your, your and figure out your graph at a glance. 
but goodness, uh, how long does it take to figure this out? Uh, personally, I'd rather just see a table with these numbers in it. And I think if they were presenting it that way, I think people would get it a little easier. So this is really what we uh, know as chart junk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, one final part mm -hmm. about pie charts. This, this kind of sums it up. <laughs> Number of occasions for which you pie charts are a good choice. And unfortunately, the number of occasions when people use them. Yeah. So be careful. Now we're going to get away from charts, traditional charts at any rate. Now this, this I know this looks a bit busy, and uh, I wouldn't really make one like this. But I wanted to show you this because this is kind of a new visualization that businesses are using um, when the well, like the manager or the CEO wants to keep track of data continually and wants it all in one, one place. So generally how these are done is that you tie the, the uh, data or what they call key performance indicators to computers that will track and automatically update um, all these little things that really matter to them, like sales and expenses, etc. And, uh, you know, if this were live, these would be changing all the time. So whenever the, the CEO clicks on this page, he sees the very latest things. Um, it's a pretty useful example, actually, of, of what data dashboards look like, because you can actually understand most of it. Um, although I've seen a lot of them where they take the metaphor a little too literally, and instead of having this simple bar charts or line charts, they'll <laughs> try to make fuel gauges, speedometers, <laughs> stuff like that that really, really too don't work too well. They're creative, but they don't work very well. Now, what I did here, this is something you might have seen on my website if you ever go there. Um, what I decided to do is uh, make a hybrid. Uh, I thought, gee, I thought data dashboards were really cool, but I don't have any data that has to be updated all the time. Um, what I really need is a snapshot. So that's what this is. Um, I saw someone else who had done um, a summary like this of uh, the survey. And I thought, well, that would be really cool for showing annual statistics. So I combined uh, the charts and graphs of the data dashboards with some tables that are very simple, and just show, in a nutshell, what happened in 2007-2008. And added some more interest and some context by showing then um, what that meant. What was the change over time? How did it compare with previous years? So I'm still working on a really better one of these, but and you guys might want to do this too. It's kind of fun because all, all this really is is it's an Excel spreadsheet. Um, each one of these little things are cells. Then we just go in and and kind of white out some of the grid lines, and there you have it. So, um, so I think I might do another one of these. Kind of cool. Mm -hmm. You can tell me if you think so too. If you don't like them, tell me. Oh, somebody has a question. Cool. Okay, okay. question. Oh, I gotta, I gotta tangle with my math. <laughs> <laughs> A UNL Stadium Library example. Well, actually, the that that the stadium, the figure I was using for the stadium was eighty-one thousand something. That's why I got uh, what I did. So. so what you missed was the figure I was using. I guess uh, maybe I missed the last stadium edition. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry about that. But you get the idea. I should go on that chart of complaints about your... <laughs> yeah, get that get that uh, chart complaint thing back up here. <laughs> okay, here we have uh, math you might have seen before. Uh, sometimes geographic information is important. And uh, fortunately, we now have map mashups that make it relatively easy to show data by location. 
Um, it tells the viewer at a glance just how public libraries are distributed across the state. And let me show you the actual map here so we can play around with it. Because it is interactive. It isn't just a static thing yeah. here. Uh, it takes a while for this to plot. Not too long. So what I did here is I took the the 2000, fiscal year 2008 uh, statistical survey and converted it. I just took my spreadsheet and I geocoded it. I just I took the addresses and ran them through a program that assigns latitude and longitude to them to come up with this uh, little map mashup of where things are in Nebraska. And then what I did is I kind of assigned the color categories by population range. So you can see from the colors very quickly where uh, different size libraries are located across the state. Um, then, of course, you can also go into each map marker and get more information about what's going on with that library. Okay. That is very cool, I think. <laughs> I love this. This is fun to make. Yeah, yeah. I love doing this. <laughs> but, you know, it's not just fun. It's, it's really kind of interesting because what, um, what I discovered when I was showing this to the library commissioners was, you know, you can say, and it's true, that 58% of Nebraska's public libraries serve communities of under 1,000 people. But what does that really look like? Well, you can go into this uh, legend down here and eliminate all the libraries and you see what an impact that has. Look what's left. Much fewer libraries. So I think that this is a way to show some context and some impact and maybe surprise your users too. So, so I really like maps. I like them so much that I made another one. <laughs> I'll show you one that I made uh, as we work on broadband issues in Nebraska libraries. On this one, I, I took the same libraries course, and I, but I, the legend actually shows um, the speed of that library's internet connection. So we can kind of get an idea of how well we're doing in terms of broadband across the state. What's kind of fun about this one is you can see how many slow connections we have or no connections we have by fooling around with it. Like, let's take the ones that have over 5 megabits per second. Well, it doesn't change much. <laughs> Most of them are below that. And, you can, and this is an easy way to see that we have a ways to go to really get um, fast broadband in the rest of libraries. So that's why I did that. And I'll show you one more map because I, I just I really love this. One. This was done by David Draws from uh, the State Data Center at UNO. He does one of these. Uh, he has a new one. I, I didn't happen to find that one, but he does one every year. He's been tracking this uh, population change in Nebraska. And gosh, you look at this map, and when I first saw it, I was just taken aback by... Um, how the population is changing in Nebraska. I don't, I don't want to scare you, but um, you can see that the red ones here were, are counties where the population increased both from 1990 to 2000, you know, for the 2000 census, and also increased during the 2000 to 2007 uh, annual estimates. So these are the ones that are are really growing. You can kind of see the pattern of where they're, where they're distributed along the interstate and along the this uh, uh, north-south uh, eastern quarter, north, probably the eastern fourth of the state. So, and the, the real impact is these uh, vanilla ones uh, that decreased over both of those periods of time. So. You know, it's a real, it's a real good way for him to show this uh, 
all his database reflectors. I really like this one. So, you know, the, the idea about this is that sometimes you can use maps to really bring home your point. Here's what I really like that's different. Um, this was done by LA. Uh, help me, I don't even remember when I found this. But I just loved it. I still have it on my bulletin board. Because I love the way they did this. Um, and you, you may have seen similar things like this, maybe in text only and things like Time Magazine. What they did is they said, okay, we're going to take, we're going to bring the reader's eyes to this page. And the first thing we're going to show them is these big numbers. But if they want to know the context for that number, they've got to go closer and read the accompanying text to see what that number means. And, of course, the graphics help illustrate even further what we're talking about. But I think what this, what's great about this is that it holds the reader's attention. It, it uh, is interesting. It says, what? look at that huge number. What the heck are they talking about? And so it pulls them into the page and then provides them an opportunity for some self-discovery. They can discover for themselves what this means. And I think what that means for the presenter is that the information is going to tend to stay with the reader. It was a very surprising in many cases. So you'd want to use this for some of your most surprising or significant data. Another one we, we are, have done here a couple of years um, does a similar kind of thing. I mean, the graphics tell you, oh, this is libraries. Um, and then we're taking familiar things. Remember that picture of the Memorial Stadium where it was very familiar to people? What we did is we said, well, let's take a look at the visits to the libraries in Nebraska, and let's relate that to something familiar. So Henry Dory Zoo, the Quest Center, a lot of people have been there, and they know, you know, that, gee, it looks awfully crowded here. But you can see that in comparison, uh, the annual attendees at libraries is much greater than either of these two very popular events. And then again down here, we did a similar thing. We said, well, you know, the number one paid attendance attraction in Nebraska is the zoo, but hey, for free attendance, it's Nebraska libraries. So just a way to kind of bring things home. And then compare them. Like down here we compared the circulation, what's the national average. And what are we doing here? We're supplying context. Because by itself, uh, who would know that 7.4 was better than the national average? And yes. so it was therefore very good. Yeah. Yeah. Now here, pocket guides. I like pocket guides because they're like the, the text version of an elevator speech. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you don't know what an elevator speech is, it's something that um, uh, public relations people give their employees and say, okay, if you're stuck in an elevator with someone, and they would say, well, what do you do? And, oh, and what does your organization, uh, what's their mission? What do they do? You'd have a, a quick little, what we call elevator, elevator speech that would sum up all the good things that you do. So in this case, this is a little pocket guide. In the size, it's kind of like, it, when it's all folded up, and it'll be like one of these panels, and it's just a little bigger than a business card. It's a very easy way to distribute the, the most important parts of your statistics. So those are the kind of charts I wanted to show you and the, and the means of presenting data. So now I'm down to my caveat about Excel. Now I, use, I love Excel. I use it every day. And I wouldn't be able to do my job without it. But, uh, hmm. This is a portion of the chart choices in Excel 2007. It goes down further. And the problem with this is that there are only about 10% of these that I would actually use. And I would only use those because they're the ones that would actually present the data in a clear and simplistic way, not simplistic, but simple uh, way. Because and, and you don't see it here, but when you're choosing them, when you're creating a graph, you'll see that they'll be, uh, they'll group these by 2D and 3D. Well, I wish there a way to just delete the 3Ds, <laughs> which is all of these, because do you really want to show uh, a bar chart with pyramids? 
Uh, do you really want a line chart with this kind of wavy, wavy thing? It's, it's, there's just no way you can you can look at this and see the data as easily as you can with this one. Okay. Um, so if you're using Excel, uh, my advice is ignore a lot. <laughs> use what they would I wish that what some of these uh, software developers would do is give you some very basic tools like maybe these three here although I don't like stacked column charts and give you more information on how to select the right choice for your data mm -hmm. they, they would take a look at your spreadsheet or your database and say okay you know here's what I'd do I'd present it like this because it would be a lot more interesting because what you have to remember here is what you're trying to do is what? You're trying to be clear. You're trying to keep it simple. You're trying to be brief, accurate, and provide context. Now, I'm going to skip here over a slide. Doink, doink. Um, before I leave you, I want to do a, a shameless plug for the Library Commission. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've got you here. Um, you know, uh, I want to encourage people to visit these these sites because, gosh, you know, we all work really hard to provide uh, up-to-date information and newsworthy uh, information that you guys can all use. If you go to our homepage here, first thing you're going to see is announcements of what's going on and what you need to know about. Uh, if you go to the blog, we we do all kinds of things on the blog. You know, uh, what are the new uh, online classes you might see? Uh, I might do some thing about explaining a tool like data.gov or, or talk about uh, LJ Index libraries, something like that. There are, will often be very interesting and topical information here. So you should take a look at it. And if you're at all inter interested in statistics, in the public library survey, in national statistics, you can go to the data services page here where a lot of that stuff resides and where you can actually go to get past years of annual data. So this is also can be a very useful tool. And of course, uh, if you love the uh, Encompass Online, as I'm sure you do, this is where you go to find out what's going to come, come up uh, in the future, and it's a way to go to the archives. So if you've missed something really neat, you can go back and take a look at it. So, you know, you got to bookmark all these, uh, a couple of these, put them on your RSS feed. Take a look at these often. Very, very useful. So after that shameless plug, I will stop. <laughs> I hope you don't look like this at this time. <laughs> I can't see you, so it's not going to hurt my feelings. So, does anybody have any questions about anything that we? Uh, does Thanks, John. Any... That was a very clear um, explanation of using charts. I really appreciated it. Are, is the chart that you made, uh, not the chart, but the display with the statistics on both and the chart in the middle? Is that on the web someplace? You did that on. It will be. It will be. In fact, this, uh, are we going to put this on SlideShare? Yeah, well, this whole presentation, well, I think she means the actual chart where you did the one of the, oh, yeah. the yeah. three different sections. Yes, I'll yeah. be putting that on, on the, uh, well, yeah, I just showed you the other site. I'll be putting that on the data services page uh, uh, very shortly. Yes. Yeah, okay. and also this PowerPoint presentation will be put up when we when I put up the recording of the session probably tomorrow, um, so you'll be able to download it from our SlideShare account. And all of the links that um, John talked about, linked to or just showed, will also be well they're already actually in our Delicious account here for the commission, so you um, can access um, all of those from there. Any other questions from anybody? Okay, I know we ran a little off on our time because we had some technical difficulties at the beginning, but I'm glad some of you came back and stuck around. Um, thank you very much, John. That was very interesting and useful, I think. I don't know a lot about this stuff. I don't do statistics. <laughs> I took one statistics class in library school. That was it. <laughs> That's enough. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, I hope you'll join us next week when we will be doing a behind-the-scenes look at the Talking Book and Braille service, meeting the volunteers and staff who work down there. So hopefully you'll join us next week at 10 a.m. Wednesday, um, 10 a.m. Central Time. And uh, this has been recorded and will be available, as I said, probably tomorrow. So thank you very much for attending. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.